Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The glorious era that was Tudor England helped shape the early exploration and colonization of the North American continent. Join me as we continue a deep dive into Tudor England and its great transatlantic explorers. Tudor King Henry VIII died in 1547, leaving England's crown to his son Edward VI, whose short reign led to the royal ascension of his two sisters and the imminent exploration and colonization of America. In 1544, King Henry VIII, now in the third decade of his reign, bestrode England like an aging colossus by making himself supreme head of the Church of England. He had taken the monarchy to the peak of its power, but at a huge personal cost. For the supremacy had been born out of Henry's desperate search for an heir and love. The turmoil of six marriages, two divorces, two executions and a tragic bereavement had produced three children by three different and mutually hostile mothers. It was a fractured and unhappy royal family. Now the king felt it was time for reconciliation. Henry's reunion with his family is commemorated in a famous painting known as the family of Henry VIII. The painting shows Henry enthroned between his son and heir, the seven-year-old Edward, and, to emphasise the line of dynastic succession, Edward's long-dead mother, Jane Seymour. Standing further off to the right is Henry's elder daughter Mary, whom he bastardised when he divorced her mother, and to the left his younger daughter Elizabeth, whom he also bastardised when he had her mother beheaded. But this is more than a family portrait. It also symbolises the political settlement by which Henry hoped to preserve and prolong his legacy. To secure the Tudor succession, he decided that all three of his children would be named as his heirs. His son Edward would, of course, succeed him. But if Edward died childless, the throne would pass to his elder daughter, Mary. If she had no heir, then her half-sister Elizabeth would become queen. The arrangement was embodied both in the king's own will and in an act of parliament. Henry's provisions for the succession held, and, through the rule of a minor and two women, gave England a sort of stability. But they also ushered in profound political turmoil as well, since, it turned out, each of Henry's three children was determined to use the royal supremacy to impose a radically different form of religion on England. First, there would be the zealous Protestantism of Edward, then the passionate Catholicism of Mary. Finally, it would be left to Elizabeth to try to reconcile the opposing forces unleashed by her siblings. The divisions within Henry's family reflected the religious confusion in the country as a whole. The reformation of the church had been radical at times, cautiously conservative at others. In some parts of the country, people had embraced Protestantism and stripped their local churches of icons and Catholic ceremonies. In others, the people cleaved to the old ways, afraid of the radical change that had been unleashed. Like the royal family, Henry's subjects were divided amongst themselves, unsure of the full implications of the supremacy. Containing this combustible situation was Henry VIII, with all his indomitable personality. On Christmas Eve, 1545, Henry made his last speech to Parliament. It was an emotional appeal for reconciliation between conservatives who hankered after a return to Rome and radical Protestants who wished to press on to a complete reform of the Church. Henry sought a middle way which would both preserve the royal supremacy and prevent their quarrel from tearing England apart. It was also an expression of his personal views. He held on to the old ceremonies of the religion he had known from his youth. At the same time, he had repudiated the papacy that was their bedrock. And, as he was determined that his people should continue to tread the same narrow path, he made no secret of his contempt for the extremes in the religious dispute. Both were unyielding and zealous. Both were, in some way, flouting royal spiritual authority. Radicals and conservatives alike were under notice that unseemly disputes in the religious life of the country would not be tolerated. Just over a year later, on the 28th of January, 1547, 
Henry was dead, age 55, and with him died any prospect that the royal supremacy would be used to save England from religious conflict. Three weeks later, Henry's nine-year-old son was crowned King Edward VI at Westminster Abbey. The ceremony was conducted by Thomas Cranmer, England's first Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury, who, 16 years earlier, had helped Henry VIII to achieve supreme authority over church and state. But the supremacy had not taken the church as far as he had wanted down the road of reform. Now Cranmer used Edward's coronation to spell out fully the supremacy's awe-inspiring claims. During the ceremony, no fewer than three crowns were placed successively on the boy king's head. The second was the imperial crown itself, the symbol of the imperial monarchy to which Edward's grandfather Henry VII had aspired and which his father, Henry VIII, had achieved. And it wasn't only the crown. Instead, Cranmer turned the whole ceremony into a parable of the limitless power of the new imperial monarchy. First, he administered the coronation oath to the king. But then, in a moment that was unique in the thousand-year history of the coronation, he turned directly to the king and congregation to explain, or rather, to explain away, what he had done. He had just administered the oath to the king, he said. But, he continued, it was a mere ceremony. God had conferred the crown on Edward, and no human could prescribe conditions or make him abide by an oath. Neither he nor any other earthly man had the right to hold Edward to account during his reign. Instead, the chosen of God, the king, was answerable only to God. Your majesty is God's vice-regent and Christ's vicar within your own dominions, Cranmer told the little boy. And to see, with your predecessor Josiah, God truly worshipped and idolatry destroyed, the tyranny of the bishops of Rome banished from your subjects and images removed. The full nakedness of the absolutism established by Henry VIII now stood revealed, and both those who ruled in Edward's name and, at the fullness of time, Edward himself, were determined to use its powers to the uttermost. For Edward was being tutored by thoroughgoing Protestants, and he learned his lessons well, writing in an essay at the age of twelve that the Pope was the true son of the devil, a bad man, an antichrist. Edward and his counsellors, now determined to use the supremacy to force religious reform and make England a fully Protestant, godly nation. It was a resort to one of the extremes that Henry had warned against in his last speech. And there was much to reform, for, as part of Henry's cautious middle way, most English churches and much ceremony had remained unchanged. But, thanks to Edward's education in advanced Protestantism, he believed that his father's reign had been marred by undue caution in religious reform. So now Edward and his council ordered the culmination of the Reformation, or, in other words, a revolution in the spiritual life of the country. Stained glass windows, the crosses over the choir screens, and the crucifixes on the altars were torn down and burnt. The pictures of saints were whitewashed, and the Latin Mass replaced by the English of the 1549 Book of Common Prayer, written by Cranmer himself. England had had a reformation. Now, many said as bonfires raged through the country and statues were vandalised, it was going through a deformation. Where once the crucifix hung high above the heads of the congregation for veneration, there was now just one image, the royal coat of arms. Next time, we continue our story with more excerpts from the audiobook Monarchy from the Middle Ages to Modernity by David Starkey. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.